As you probably know, I am a huge proponent of index investing because of its simplicity and its effectiveness to help regular people like you and me to get the market returns we deserve. But how does this simple investing approach work? How can index investing be implemented by people like you and me? And how can it help us build financial security and reach financial independence? This is what we're going to discuss in this incredible interview with Jill Collins. Hi, friend. This is Sebastian Aguilar, and welcome to this incredible interview with one of the most influential people in the financial independence movement. In this interview, you will learn about the most effective way to invest in the stock market and how to use it to reach financial independence. If you're interested in investing, you're going to learn a lot from this interview. I also invite you to download my beginner's guide to index investing, for which you can find the link in the description. And this is a great guide I've put together to help people like you get started on the journey to index investing and financial independence. My guest today is someone I have looked up to and learned from ever since I have started my investing journey. His investing experience spans many decades. He actually started investing many years before I was born. In 2011, he wrote a series of letters to his daughter about money and investing, what had worked for him and what had not worked for him. He later shared all of this investing wisdom on his blog and then in his life-changing book, The Simple Path to Wealth, Your Roadmap to Financial Independence and a Rich Free Life. Learning from him actually feels like cheating because he makes it so simple for us to beat all professional investment managers over the long term, of course. He is the founder of the FI Shitakwa, an annual gathering where you can meet most of the brilliant minds of the FI world and talk about money, life, and happiness. His teachings have changed the lives of many, including mine. So it's a great honor for me to bring you the man who is also known as the godfather of the financial independence movement, JL Collins. Thank you very much. What a wonderful introduction. I, I hope I can live up to that. <laughs> that's just that's what you've done already so far. Just a fraction of what you've done. So well, it's an honor to be here. Um, Jill, thanks thanks for joining us. Obviously, this is Fire Belgium. Uh, a lot of the people in the audience are based in Belgium, but we also have quite an international uh, community. People joining from all around the world. Um, um, I have prepared a few questions so that we can sort of very quickly dive into the the you know your story and your experience with uh, with investing so i suggest we start with that um for those who have no idea how do we define fu money and how do we define financial independence well i suppose different people define those things differently so this is simply my opinion uh fu money is just having enough money that you're able to make bolder decisions uh, you don't, it's not enough money necessarily to never work again, but it is enough money to step away from a job that might not be working for you anymore, uh, to take a break, to take a sabbatical and, and then move on. That's actually how I spent my career. Cause of course, when I was young, there was no concept of this stuff of this whole financial independence journey. But I had come across the term FU money in a novel by James Covell, Noble House. And I thought, that's what I want. I want enough money that I can always be independent and always step away from situations that I want to, or people that I want to step away from. Now, financial independence is the next step beyond that. That's where you have enough money that if you choose, you don't have to work for money anymore. Your investments alone are enough to cover your, your expenses. Thank you. So, and in your view, which one is more powerful? Is it FU money or is it FI? Well, I think obviously FI is the more powerful one because it, it means that you're completely financially independent and you no longer have to trade your labor for, for money. But I hasten to say that it, this is not an on-off switch. Uh, the moment somebody begins this journey, the moment they save and invest their first dollar, they're a little freer and a little more powerful than they were the day before. And every step on the journey, you become freer 
and more powerful until ultimately you hit that point where working is optional. Interestingly, in my experience, both my personal experience and meeting people in the FI community, vast majority of them continue to do active, productive things after they've achieved financial independence, but they no longer have to do it for money, even if in fact it pays them something. Mm -hmm. and, and that changes work profoundly, by the way, when you don't have to do it for the money. Yeah, it's, it is a very big change indeed. Um, can you give us some example of a few money and maybe how that has uh, impacted your life or how you have used it? Yeah, so uh, probably the best example is early in my professional life. When I came out of college in 1972, so now everybody knows how ancient I am. And when I came out of college in 1972, it was a very bad economy and it took me two years to get my first professional job. So it was hard to get. And I liked it a lot. I, you know, I enjoyed that job, but I wanted to, and I think everybody listening knows that I'm, I'm an American. And one of the things that I wanted to do back in those days was to backpack through Europe. And I wanted to take several months. And companies were not at all flexible in those days. And so that decision meant probably I would have to leave this job that I liked and that was so hard to get. But I'd saved up the princely amount of $5,000, which in those days was enough that I could have done this for a year and probably had a little bit of a cushion when I got back to find the next job. And I went back and forth in my head as to what to do. And finally, I went to my boss and I thought, well, maybe there is some flexibility. Maybe I don't have to quit the job. Maybe I could just get an extended period of time off. And in those days, there was an airfare that if you left on a specific day and came back four months later on a specific day to and from Luxembourg, interestingly enough, it was a very low airfare. And I thought, well, maybe I'll go and ask if I can have four months off. And so I did, and of course, they said no. <laughs> and in those days, I was young and naive. I didn't know things could be negotiated. So I said, okay, and I went back and I, well, now I really do have a decision to make. You know, do I quit or do I stay in this job? And after thinking about it for a week or two, I went back and I resigned. And to my amazement, my boss said, well, why do you want to quit? And I said, well, because I, you know, I want to do this thing in Europe. And so, well, don't do anything hasty. Let me talk to the owner of the company. This is a small company. And then they came back and they said, you know, if you, promise that you'll come back in four months, we will hold your job open for you. But what we would prefer to do is just maybe give you a few extra weeks of vacation. By the way, for my European friends there who don't know, we don't get vacations the way folks in, in Europe get vacations. You know, you get maybe two weeks a year. And uh, uh, so I didn't know you could negotiate to begin with, but I wasn't entirely slow. And I And they offered a month and I said about, about six weeks and a month every year going forward, which was a huge victory. And that's what we did. So that's a few money at, at work. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible without even really realizing it. No. Yeah. Without realizing, I had no idea that I had that kind of power, you know, yeah. but if I hadn't had the $5,000, I, I never, if I was living paycheck to paycheck and worried about paying the rent, I never would have been bold enough. That would have been silly to, to do something like that. And so you were naturally saving or like, how, how come you had that kind of money already set aside so early? So I always knew uh, from the moment I came across this concept of a few money, that's what I wanted. In fact, even before mm. I came across the concept, money represented security for me because my father who, uh, had been fairly successful in his career. He was a heavy cigarette smoker. He developed emphysema and as his health declined, our family fortunes declined and he was not a saver and investor. And so we went from being pretty solidly middle-class to struggling terribly as his ability to earn declined. And I, I didn't ever want to be in that position. So money for me meant security. And so I knew I wanted to have that security. And then I came across the term FU money. So from the moment I started working, I saved and invested 50% of my income. Mm. 
interesting enough in the FI community, there are people sneer at only 50%, you know, that <laughs> usually be 60, 70, 80%. And I applaud that, but there was no FI community when I made that decision. And of course, other people not in the FI community are horrified at the idea of, of saving half your income. They don't think it's possible. Well, I'm pretty sure everybody listening to us is, knows that it's possible and might even be modest. Yeah, but I mean, 50% at such a young age or when you start your career, that is pretty tough at that point normally, but uh, so yeah. Well, not really, because I came out of college, you know, I had to put myself through college and I was used to living cheap because right. I had to live cheap. And so I just kept living cheap. In fact, I was able to substantially increase my, my style of living even on 50% because college was really <laughs> living cheap. <laughs> so the key is to have no money in college and get used to a simple and effective lifestyle. Well, the, and the key is not to, not to uh, have what's called lifestyle inflation. Yeah. So I think a lot of people in college are, are, have very modest incomes and live cheaply and know how to do it. But most people, when they come out of college and they start making better money, immediately start spending all of that. Tragically, some of some people start spending even more going into debt to maintain certain lifestyle. And that becomes a, a pretty nasty trap. But if you don't fall into that trap to begin with, then it's, it's really pretty easy. I feel bad for people who come to, uh, to my way of thinking later in their life where maybe they've been 10, 20 years uh, living at what's considered a normal life in our society and living paycheck to paycheck and, and developing a certain kind of lifestyle and rolling back from that is a lot more difficult than never starting it again and never starting it to begin with rather. So I just never started it. And then as my career expanded, my income expanded, so did my living because I kept saving 50%. So my first income when I got out of college, my first job was $10,000 a year. So I saved and invested five and lived on the other five and you know, a few years later, when it was 20,000 a year, well, now I was living on 10 and saving and investing 10. And I just maintained that all my life. So my life did improve materially, but at a controlled rate that allowed me to be financially independent and have a few money and then ultimately be completely free. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. No, I mean, obviously 50% throughout your life, that's very, very powerful. It's almost like a superpower compared to what we see other people do. It is. And, and yeah, and that's, that's what I tell people. You can, if, if you really want to get to F, FI as fast as possible and you want to save 70, 80%, that's awesome. I applaud that. But you don't have to do that mm -hmm. to get there. I mean, 50% will, will get you there in some like 12, 13 years depending on how strong the market wind is at your back, you know, depending on market conditions over that decade. But yeah. Thank you, Jill. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your, your journey as a blogger and financial author. Sure. Um, so your blog has become super famous in the financial independent movement and beyond. Uh, your book has taken you, I'm sure, to all sorts of exciting places. I was, I was interested, I would, I'm interested to hear about from you what has been the most unexpected outcome or experience from, from, from all this? Well, I think the whole thing has been unexpected, actually. I, as you alluded to in your, in your very kind introduction, this all started in 2011 when I started writing a series of letters about financial things to my daughter, things that I wanted her to know that she wasn't quite ready to hear. And uh, I wanted them to be available in case I wasn't around. Not to be morbid, but you know, things happen. And a friend of mine suggested that I put those on a blog and I wasn't interested in becoming a blogger, but I thought what a great way to archive the information. And that's what I did with just the idea of, of archiving it for her. And the same friend said, you know, you gotta share it with friends and family. So I did, that's why my blog has my name, JL Collins and H instead of some cool name like the mad scientist or Mr. Money Mustache or, or uh, you know, 1500 days of, you know, my blogging friends, they 
they had a better strategy than I did. I was just archiving information and I wanted friends and family to know it was me. Of course, those friends and family never cared. But to my amazement, I began to develop an audience. And now I have an international audience. And, you know, is the outgrowth of that is the book that you were kind enough to mention, Chautauquas, which is where you and I met. Uh, the you book, know, for everyone yeah, who, hasn't, who doesn't have the book, get it. Because this is the most effective way of investing and learning about investment, for sure. I'm, it's, it's, I'm reading it to my son, who's one and a half year old. So, yeah. to my amazement, that sold over two hundred thousand copies, and I self-published it. Uh, so all of that, you know, I, I my daughter, uh, who's now an adult and who is on the FI path, but I pushed the stuff much too hard and much too young, and turned her off to it which is why I had to sit down and write it all out and why the blog started. And then that led to the book and the Chautauquas and to a really amazing decade. Uh, and my daughter teases me. She says, you know, dad, if I'd listened to you when I was young, you wouldn't have all this. It's only because <laughs> I refused to listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to put it in writing so that you release it later. Yeah, I was pretty yeah. frustrated at the time she wasn't <laughs> listening, but it certainly turned out for the better. That's really cool. And so what has been, uh, can you tell us about a very interesting or most interesting encounter you've had in this, in these last nine years? Oh, probably meeting you. Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, no, no, but for real. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's hard to single, it's hard to single one out, Sebastian, but when I say meeting you, I'm, I'm only partially teasing. I mean, certainly meeting you and people like you by extension. Uh, has been the most amazing part of this. I have a whole new group of friends uh, that are based on this common interest we share. And those friends are all around the world. They're of all ages. They're of all races. They're of all belief systems. And that's incredible. I mean, you and I never would have met without this path. And that's multiplied for me, uh, you know, across all the folks that I've met in Chautauqua and other places, it's, and that's meeting these people, meeting you, and by extension, other people like you, has just been an incredibly uh, enriching experience for me. And that was, when I first started the blog and started writing this thing down, that I had no concept that that was ahead, that that was going to be in the path that I'd that I'd stepped on really by accident without knowing I was stepping on this kind of path. Yeah, well, look, you're an inspiration to all of us, so we're very happy to be able to chat to you. <laughs> well, and it's a two-way street. I mean, uh, you know, yeah. the people that I engage with are an inspiration to me. That's very, very kind of you. Um, I like to talk about investing, obviously. That's the, you know, that's the main topic uh, of today. Um, in a few words, uh, how would you define your investing philosophy? Well, let's see. I, I think I would say, first of all, uh, avoid debt. Uh, debt is like a ball and chain that you drag around in your life. Uh, it's almost impossible to become uh, financially independent if you're dragging that, that ball and chain around. Uh, I say, as we alluded to earlier, live less, live on less than you earn and uh, invest the difference. And my recommendation is you invest in low cost index funds. So avoid debt, live on less than you earn and invest. And the more you invest, obviously, the stronger you'll be financially and the sooner you will, you will have that strength, the faster that strength will grow. And you mentioned index funds. What what, um, what makes index fund your favorite strategy and not another one? Well, so index funds are, maybe we should start and, and define what, what they are. So an index fund simply says, uh, I'm, I'm going to track and buy every stock in a given index. So here in the United States, and you'll have to forgive me because I don't know the European markets and what's available in Europe. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on what I do know. 
So when Jack Bogle created the first index fund in 1975, it was the S&P 500 index fund. The S&P 500 index is made up of the 500 largest companies in the United States. And that was the first index fund. It is still a great index fund. And then well, I think sometime in the 90s, if I remember correctly, Vanguard created what they call the total stock market index fund. Again, US based. And now this is every publicly traded company in the United States, last count about 3,600. And an index fund, whether it's the S&P 500 or the total stock market, doesn't try to predict which of these companies are gonna do better than which others or which are gonna do less well. It just buys them all. Uh, it buys them on a cap weighted basis. So it buys more of the largest ones. And amazingly that dramatically outperforms all of those mutual fund managers who are active managers. And so you have index, index fund investing and active fund investing are sort of the two polar opposites. And active fund managers spend their time trying to figure out what companies are going to do better in buying those and what companies are going to do less well in avoiding those. That seems, and this is why it personally took me a long time to embrace indexing, embarrassingly long time, it seems pretty obvious that if I just avoid the worst stocks, I'm going to outperform the index. Right? Or if I just buy the best stocks, I'm going to outperform the index. But the problem is sometimes those worst stocks turn out to be tomorrow's exciting turnaround stories. And sometimes those best stocks turn out to be Enron. Enron's a large U.S. company that collapsed in a spectacular fashion uh, in, in 2008. Uh, very large, well-regarded company that just collapsed out of nowhere. So it's extraordinarily difficult to figure out which companies are gonna do well and, and which are not. And the research over the decades since index funds were created has, has confirmed that it's virtually impossible. Over a 30 year period, there's less than 1% of active managers outperform. That's statistically zero. And of course, the shorter the time period, the more active managers will outperform, but even then, you have no way of knowing of the whole universe of active managers, which ones will be that 20% that will outperform this year, or that 15% that out, might outperform for the next three to five years. You know, so even if you get lucky and, and pick the right one, that doesn't mean they can continue to do it. In fact, almost inevitably they, they can't. So it's not as simple as looking at which one's the best manager right now and then say betting on that that manager and hoping he's going to continue performing isn't that a good strategy that's that's actually probably the worst strategy because almost inevitably uh whoever the stars are currently are are going to fall off uh in the coming years it's it's almost uncanny how that happens there was when i used to uh, invest i used to pick individual stocks. I used to be an active guy, right? I used to pick individual stocks and individual mutual funds that were run by people picked individual stocks. Here in the US, there was a guy there, and I think he's, he's still around. There's a guy named Ken Hebner. And I'm, this is going back now, probably into the 90s, who was the absolute superstar at the time. I mean, he was just setting up incredible numbers for a couple of years in a row. And I was in his fund and that was great until it stopped being great. And then suddenly he fell to the bottom of the heap. Same strategy, same guy. Ken Hebner didn't suddenly get stupid. He was an exceedingly bright guy. It's just the wheel turns and the strategy that he was using that worked so well for a few years suddenly was in a period of time where that strategy just didn't work as well. And so it's, it's an almost an impossible task for uh, for managers to maintain that kind of a that kind of a lead. Markets uh, are very very efficient things, right? So, index fund investing is I favor it because it's easier. You don't have expensive managers, so it's cheaper, and it's more powerful. So I never, yeah. yeah so 
I'm sorry, I'm going to stay on my soapbox for a moment longer. I never have to worry about whether my fund manager is losing his touch or not, because the S&P or the, the total stock market index fund that I'm in, BTSAX, is always going to be the same and it's always going to perform well. And it's what I call self-cleansing. What that means is that as companies lose their touch and, and fade away or do poorly, then they slide off the index. Uh, companies that do well stay on the index and, and continue to grow and prosper. So the most any company can lose is 100%, right? It can go to zero, it can go out of business. Now, a company will fall off the index before it gets to zero, but it still can drop dramatically before it falls off. But the upside is unlimited. You know, a company on the way up isn't limited to 100% or 200% or 500% or 10,000%. So it's, in that sense, kind of a rigged game. And the index is continually cleansing itself. That's a term I've become proud of because I coined it. So the index is self <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, you, you did mention that you were a, a more active investor, stock picker at the beginning. Can you tell us a little bit about how that changed and like when that changed for you? Yeah, well, <laughs> how it changed was way too slowly. <laughs> so uh, in my defense, I, I looking back, I became financially independent in 1989. And sort of my dirty little secret is that I did it picking individual stocks and picking actively managed mutual funds, which is not what I recommend today. The point, and I think it's an important one, is not that those things don't work because you can make money and you can achieve financial independence picking individual stocks and picking active managers. I did it, it is possible. The problem is it's harder, more expensive and less powerful than index funds. So had I embraced index funds sooner, I simply would have achieved financial independence a little bit earlier with a whole lot less effort. Now, why didn't I do that? Well, besides the fact that I'm a slow learner and a little bit stupid, uh, there is no excuse. I, index funds were, in, interestingly enough, created in 1975, which was the year I bought my first stock, the year I started investing. I didn't know that at the time. I had not heard of them. Of course, they were a very small, insignificant thing in those days. About 1985, a friend of mine who was a financial analyst first brought index investing to my attention. Uh, he came out of uh, the University of Chicago, which was a big proponent of, of markets being very efficient and therefore it being a waste of time to try to outsmart them, right? And I just couldn't accept it. I, you know, I was, I was doing reasonably well picking stocks. And this idea that just buying everything would outperform, again, the hubris of, of thinking, well, if I just avoid the bad stocks, I'm going to outperform. And it probably took me 10 or 15 years of, before I embraced indexing. And I kept in, in, and that's a little embarrassing to admit, quite honestly, but the good side is I kept looking at it. The idea was intriguing and I kept looking at it. It just took me a long time to get comfortable doing it again because what I was doing was working. So it's not like you're dealing with something that's not working and you're looking for something that will. It's like you're dealing with something that is working for you, but this the other thing might be better. And of course now, and, and candidly, research kept building up year after year. There was more and more research confirming how powerful indexing was. So, you know, against, again, even somebody as slow and stupid as me catches on. <laughs> so is it, is it then the research and the evidence that convinced you or, or was there some sort of experience with you investing specifically or like, do you, do you, can you, can you, like, is there a specific moment or something or was it really gradual that you describe now? You know, I, I, I can't point to a specific moment and I can't even for sure tell you what the, what the epiphany was mm -hmm. when I, I finally embraced it. I, I think it was just a slow 
process of, first of all, as I say, I kept my mind open to it. I kept looking at it. I kept talking to this friend of mine who had initially introduced me to it, who was an exceedingly bright guy, a guy that I have a lot of respect for. So I kept having debates with him over this and, and you know, trying to understand testing my ideas against his, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I just, over time, I, it, it just became clearer and clearer. It should not have taken that long. I guess I'm, you know. But that's because that, you were successful, uh, right? So well, it's difficult yeah. to say, well, maybe but I was you wrong. Should always, you should always be open for something that might, that might be better. Yeah. yeah. But there is something about it, about act investing that's hard to move away from i mean today the evidence is just even more clear and there's still a, a large part of the investing world that's completely convinced that active investing is the way forward um why well, the other yeah you know the other the other thing too that is worth considering is there are a few things that are more intoxicating more satisfying more thrilling than picking a stock getting it right and watching it take off. I mean, that's a pretty awesome experience. That's, <laughs> that, that's you know, I mean, that, that's, that's addictive. That's almost and, tempting. <laughs> yeah, and indexing doesn't provide that thrill. And, uh, you know, indexing just kind of relentlessly grinds forward and makes you wealthier or wealthier. Uh, but you don't have, of course, the other side of it is is you don't have the the crushing depression of picking a stock and seeing it fail and seeing it not work out you know the idea of not working out the way you thought it was going to work mm -hmm. out. so then for everyone you have that you know that, that goes to the sky there you know if you're on people who are honest with themselves realize that they they have others that don't work out so well and, and uh but indexing and so sometimes i hear people say well you know jim but i you know, I like investing. I like doing this. I like having fun with it. And I'm saying, you know, you're better off finding your fun elsewhere. You know, if you if you need thrills, go take up skydiving. You know, let mm -hmm. let indexing do the heavy lifting and make you wealthier. And and uh, you know, take up paragliding or skydiving or <laughs> whatever for your thrills. Yeah, that makes sense. So so you've gone through this transformation really in your way of looking at investing. How do you think, like, how do you convince active investors to, to, to reconsider maybe and to, to maybe convince them, how to convince them that index investing is the way forward? Or do you even do that? I don't know. Yeah, so I don't do that. Okay. I, you know, I'm, I, there are a lot of people in the FI community who have a missionary zeal that, frankly, I don't have. I, because remember, I never set out to convince anybody mm -hmm. of anything. I've said... There's only one person in my life I've ever tried to convince of this stuff, and that's my daughter. And by the way, mission accomplished. She's, she's <laughs> bad. Um, so I don't, I, I, you know, I really have no interest in convincing other people. I am thrilled when they come across my blog or my book or to Chautauqua and they see value in it and it makes sense to them. I, you know, I think that's wonderful. So don't misunderstand. I'm thrilled to have that happen. But on occasion, I have people who want to argue with me about it. And it's like, I, I don't care. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you want to keep actively investing, I don't care. <laughs> uh, I even have finally put a policy on my blog because it became so common. People would say, you know, they put a comment on the blog that would be something like, you know, I just read this article and they'd link to it and by this guy and he disagrees with you. Tell me why he's wrong. Like, well, I'm not going to do that. I, you know, I, my response to that is, look, I've, in my book and in my blog, I've expressed my ideas as clearly as I know how to express them. Uh, if I haven't expressed them clearly enough for you, then that's too bad, but I've done the best I can. I would suggest that if you find somebody else who has intriguing ideas, you read whatever they've written. And I'm, I would guess they have tried to express their ideas as clearly as they possibly can. And then you choose. And if their ideas make more sense to you than mine, it doesn't make any difference to me. Uh, 
I don't think they're right almost by definition, because if I thought they were right, I would have written something else, right? I thought active managing was the right way to do things. It wouldn't be the simple path to wealth. It would be the active path to wealth or something. So pretty clearly, I think I'm right. But, you know, if somebody thinks someone else is right, then, you know, it's a big world. <laughs> yeah, no, so I mean, I, 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 like, I like the philosophy. Yeah, so in short, I don't try to persuade anybody. <laughs> Because you get peace of mind with that perspective. And I think that's, you know, in the end, the simple path of the wealth is about peace of mind. And so yeah. you, you apply that there too. That's, I think that's brilliant. <laughs> um, for, for people who are interested in investing for the first time and they have no idea which way to go, um, like how do you present index investing to them when, you know, they're probably scared of the stock market? Well, so you should be scared of the stock market because it can be a very scary thing. And the first thing I would say to people, if you're interested and you're interested in my ideas about it, before you invest a penny, you know, you should read my blog. Uh, there is, and you can read the book. The book is a little more concise and better organized, but there's nothing in the book that you can't find on the blog, which I did by design. So you, nobody has to buy the book to get the information. You could go to the library and get the book for that matter, but do read the book and the blog and understand what the stock market is all about, what this investing strategy is all about, and then decide if you want to tolerate the volatility that you're gonna to have to tolerate to get the gains of the market. The market always goes up, it relentlessly marches up, but it's a very difficult, volatile, scary ride at times. And I've said on many occasions, and I'll say again now, that my strategy depends on not panicking and selling when the market plunges. And the market will plunge periodically. That's the nature of the beast. Uh, that's similar to living, and again, I, I, you know, I have to think in terms of the US, but that would be like living in the northern parts of the United States and being surprised when there are blizzards in winter. You're gonna get snow and blizzards in winter. It would be like living in Florida, being surprised when you get hurricanes. You're gonna get hurricanes in Florida. Now, blizzards and hurricanes can be very damaging, scary things, but they should never surprise you if you live in those areas. Market crashes can be very scary things, but they should never surprise you if you're investing in the stock market and they should never change your investing strategy. The market routinely drops 10%, that's called a correction. It fairly frequently drops 20%, that's called a bear market. And on much rarer occasions, it has a crash of 30 plus percent. All of those things are perfectly natural, in spite of what you hear in the media. The media, of course, loses its mind when these things happen and they go into full panic mode and you just have to ignore that noise because it's like the media goes in full panic mode when there's a hurricane, at least in the United States they do. Well, you know, if you live in New Orleans or in Florida, hurricanes are a part of your life. They're, they're going to be. Again, doesn't mean they're not scary and damaging, but you shouldn't be surprised by them. So just like if you're going to plan to move to Florida or New Orleans, you would have to be ready to deal with hurricanes. If you're gonna invest in the stock market, you're gonna to have to be willing to deal with the volatility and the periodic plunges that absolutely will come. You can be expected. You just have to make sure that you don't sell in the downturn. Because if you do, then my advice will leave you bleeding by the side of the road. It will have been a disservice. So lesson one, read about it, read what I have to say about it before you invest a dime, and then know yourself. And by the way, there's no shame in saying, you know what, I don't want to deal with that volatility. I can't tolerate it. I know it would keep me up at night. I know if I woke up one day and my holdings were down 40%, I'd, I'd hit the sell button. Well, it's good that you know that about yourself. And investing not only my strategy, but investing in any strategy in the stock market is not the right choice for you. Yeah, that's that's really important. Um, <laughs> Hope that's not too negative, but 
I don't want anybody to get hurt in the next downturn with it. And certainly I don't want anybody to be blindsided. I, I have one question here, where, which was, what is the most difficult part of being a DIY index investor? Is, is it what you just described? Or are there yeah, some I, other difficult challenges? Yeah, I think probably the most difficult thing for a new do-it-yourself investor is when they go through their first downturn, especially if it's a, if it's a major one. And I've often thought to myself, um, uh, you know, I, I, I had my first major one where I had significant money at stake in 1987, where we had Black Monday and the market dropped 25% in one day. I mean, that's pretty incredible. It was the worst single day drop in history, worse than anything in the Great Depression. And I was horrified. Everybody was horrified. I held the course for a couple of months while the market continued to grind down from then. And then I panicked and sold. And of course, the market, as it always does, reversed course and marched back up. And by the time I got back into it, it was higher than it had been before the crash. It was a painful, expensive lesson, but a lesson well learned. And the crashes that have come since then, I, I've sailed through unfaced. And sometimes I wonder, is it possible for somebody to listen to this and hear what I say about it and, or to read my book or my blog and, and hear what I say about it and then not panic their first time? Or do you have to live through it and, and make the mistake like I did to really embrace it deep in your gut? And I don't know the answer. It's probably different for different people. I don't think I could have just read about it and and not done the wrong thing. In fact, I had I I, I can say for sure that I didn't because I knew that the market was volatile, and I still did the wrong thing when something dramatic happened. So maybe people just have to live through that. I don't know, but I'm hoping that you can hear my words or read my words and and save yourself that that expensive lesson. Yeah, because it can, it can end up in two different ways. Either you get back in and you realize it was a mistake, and so you, you, know, you, you survive the next one because now you know, or you're burned out and you, like, you, you say, I'm going to stay away from the stock market because I was burned once and that's it. So there's sort of two ways of reacting to it, which, is, which can be very different in terms of what happens next, right? Right. The other thing that I would throw out there, and COVID is, is a great example of this, is Every time the market crashes you know, as a major drop, 30 plus percent drop, it's something terrible has happened. I mean, otherwise the market wouldn't drop. You know, we had the economic calamity in 07, 08. We had COVID earlier this year. Um, and it's always a pretty horrible thing, but we always recover from it. Always. And if the day comes where that's not true, then it won't matter where, they, where you're invested because something so serious, a civilization ending event has occurred. So for instance, in March, when the market was down 35% or something, which happened to be its low, nobody knew that at the time. I had people on my Twitter account and on uh, my blog saying, you know, Jim, I, I appreciate your philosophy, but this is different. This mm -hmm. is a pandemic. This is killing people. This time it truly is different. And I said at the time, no. I mean, I don't know if it's going to go down 60% before it's over, or I certainly didn't expect it to, to do the immediate V-shaped recovery that it did. I, I, I was saying, I have no idea what it's going to do, but it's not, the only thing that makes it different this time is tragically people are dying from the reason that the market is going down because of COVID. But the fact the market's going down is part of the normal pattern. So the next major thing that happens, I guarantee you it will feel like it's different this time. Mm -hmm. And it won't be. Mm -hmm. Just like COVID wasn't. Yeah, and, and you write that in your book, which you wrote five years ago, and you say, remember my words, next time there's a crash, everyone's going to say this time is different <laughs> and it's happening no, right now. Yeah, right. And it probably happened with the next crash too. It'll be next time is different. So it'll, it'll happen with every crash. And as I say, at some point, if I'm wrong about that, 
so much will have gone wrong in the world that that it won't matter where you're invested. I mean, it'll be a civilization ending thing. So you, we need uh, conserves and a lot of, uh, we, need, we need to have a lot of uh, f food supplies, water supplies. And yeah, that, at that point, yeah, you're, you're stocking <laughs> guns and ammunition. And food and yeah, here in Europe, not so much, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so I'm, I'm really interested in this aspect of helping people who are just getting into this for the first time and who might be facing their first, you know, volatile market and crashes. And one thing that really is difficult is seeing the media screaming, sell, sell, sell. And all the smart people, all, all of the analysts, the forecasters, people that have been right about previous market crashes saying sell, because this is, this is, this is, this is going to be, this is going to be a disaster. How do we resist? How do we stay the course as? Uh, so, the, so the first thing to understand is there is nobody out there who has been right about all the previous stock market crashes. So to give you a great example of that, in 1987, the, the one where I panicked and sold, there at the time there was a, a young woman uh, on Wall Street by the name of Elaine Garzarelli, and very attractive. And she was on, well, actually before this prediction, she wasn't on TV, but she, as it happened, called that crash almost to the day. I mean, it was almost an uncanny prediction. And of course, when the crash happened, uh, she was immediately lionized by the media and suddenly she was everywhere. And the fact that she was a very attractive young woman and the camera loved her was all to the good. And she seemed to be a very bright young woman. She went out and started her own, own firm at that point. Uh, I hope she put money away and didn't believe her own PR because she was never able to do it again, never able to predict what the market was going to do again with that kind of uncanny accuracy. That's not a criticism of Ms. Garzarelli. It's just she got lucky. What you have to understand is the next time it happens and they trot out somebody who predicted it with uncanny certainty, I'm happy to believe that that person, or maybe even several people, did that. But what you have to understand is that in any given, any given moment in time, there are thousands of people predicting what the market's going to do. And literally anything the market can possibly do, because there's so many people making predictions, somebody will have predicted it. Doesn't mean they have predictive powers. It just means that because there's so many predictions out there, one or several are bound to be right. Think of it in terms of the lottery, right? If you have a lottery with a lot at stake and you're selecting numbers and somebody gets those numbers right and they win millions of euros, you don't suddenly go out and say, ah, Sebastian won the lottery. He won millions of euros. Therefore, Sebastian has figured out how to pick winning lottery numbers. Nobody thinks that because we were sensible enough to know that Sebastian got extraordinarily lucky. He just happened to pick the numbers that won because somebody was going to pick winning numbers. It's the law of averages. It's the same thing with stock market predictions. It's a great you know, analogy. Yeah. yeah, the only difference is they don't trot Sebastian out to talk about how to pick winning lottery numbers the next time. <laughs> so. Although they could try, but they might be making money from that. I actually have a post on this called uh, uh, How to Become, a, what did I call it? Something about how to predict the stock market and become famous. And basically yeah. it says, you know, make a dramatic prediction, uh, probably predictions on the downside because scary When scary things happen, it gets more news media. So make a dramatic prediction. And then when it doesn't happen, make another one and, and keep doing it until one day you're right. And then suddenly you're famous and everybody thinks that you can predict the market. <laughs> and so in terms of practical aspect of investing or practical tips in life, how do people like protect themselves from panicking is there is there any any anything you suggest i mean obviously reading your book listening to you listening to your meditation uh, recordings which are great for market downturns 
what else can we do to sort of protect ourselves? Or is it just, you know, just be strong and resist everything? Um, are there, like, from your experience, what, what have you seen? Yeah, so last last summer, I, I recorded a guided meditation. It's mm -hmm. about 11 or 12 minutes long uh, for when the market drops. And basically, and trying to talk people off the edge. And it's okay, you know. My mm -hmm. daughter came up with calming music for it. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I think you, you know, you, you have to tie yourself to the mast. Like, uh, was it Ulysses or whoever the Greek hero was passing the, the sirens, trying to tempt them on the rocks with their songs. You just have to, you just have to resolve that when the market crashes, that a, this is normal. This is like hurricanes in Florida or blizzards in New Hampshire perfectly normal. It's going to be unpleasant, uncomfortable. It's going to be damaging, but it will pass. Mm -hmm. And the sun will come out again and the market will turn around and, and rise again. And you just have to keep reminding yourself of that fact and, and believe it and maybe turn off the TV and, and stop and stop listening to the people who are, who are, who are in full panic mode which will be everybody on Wall Street. The other thing to remember is there's two things. There's, there's speculating, right? And then there's investing. Investing is what I recommend, and we do it for the long term. I, I buy VTSAX, the Total Stock Market Index Fund, and I never sell it. I hold it literally forever, and then I will pass it on to my daughter, and she'll hold it forever. And if she's sensible, she'll pass it on to her kids, and they will hold it forever. I will literally never sell it other than maybe to raise money to live on a little selling with little bits and pieces of it. Uh, that's the way to think about it. You know, it's interesting in Europe when I, when I read novels that are, are set in Europe uh, in the early part of the last century, late 1800s, early 1900s, and they talk about wealthy people. And of course, in those days, most wealthy people were landholders, right? They owned land. And interestingly, they never talk about how much these people are worth. They talk about what their income is, you know, that they have an annual income of 20,000 uh, pounds as an example a year, which in those days would have been an enormous amount of income to have. And that's telling because they never worried day to day or week to week or year to year what their land was worth because they were never going to sell it. It was passed down through their generations. They focused on what it was earning. And I think that's the right way to think about your index fund. And because it's self-cleansing, unlike an active managed fund or buying an individual stock that no matter how good that company is today, it can go away tomorrow. That index fund is self-cleansing. It's always improving. Yeah. Yeah. So that's knowing that is the way forward, right? And then keeping believing in this simple approach is the way to ride the ups and downs. Yep. And so in your book, you talk about that the fact that we only need three simple tools, stocks, bonds, and cash for our portfolio. How do you suggest people determine how much of each they should hold? Well, that's a, you know, that's asset allocation. And that really is a function of your risk tolerance. Actually, not so much risk because stocks are not risky in the long term. They always go up, but you're rather your tolerance for volatility. So the more you own in stock, the better your performance will be long-term over the decades because stocks outperform bonds. The more you own in bonds, the smoother the ride will be because bonds are far, far less volatile than stocks. So that's the bargain you're making. If volatility bothers you, you add bonds. But of course, to the extent you add bonds and have less stocks, that's the extent that your performance over time is going to be lower. So if you want that better performance, if you want to be further ahead 20 years out, then you want to have more stocks, but you have to be willing to tolerate the more violent ride. Now, for someone like my daughter who's young and working, I recommend that she's 100% in stocks because 
every month she's putting in 50% of her income into those stocks. So when that market drops and it's volatile, that actually works in her favor because now she's getting to buy those shares on sale. In fact, I tell young people that the best thing that can possibly happen to you early in your investing career is a major market drop because now your new money that's coming in is buying those things at, at, at bargain prices. When you get to be old like me and you're living off your portfolio, then maybe you want something else to smooth the ride. So for her, what's smoothing the ride is that the income that she's earning month to month and putting in and taking advantage of those low prices. When you no longer have that income, um, if you take early retirement or retirement at any age, you probably want something else to smooth that ride. That's your bonds. And so then, if, for instance, I have 20% in bonds and 80% in stocks and then whatever's left is in cash. Uh, when the market plunges, then that percentage of bonds by definition goes up, right? Because the value of the stocks have gone down and I just shift some of those bonds over and that's how I, I buy those stocks at the, at the bargain price. And then when the market goes back up and that percentage of bonds drops, I just shift money out of, out of stocks and into bonds to retain that balance. So that's what's smoothing the ride for me. Um, now there are people, you know, who, who want to have a smoother ride than that and they have more than 20%. There are other people who, you know, are hundred percent in stocks, even though when they're retired. Uh, there are also people, by the way, who, when they become financially independent, in fact, this is probably the most common school of thought of this, say, you know, I've won the game. So why should I uh, deal with the volatility of stocks? And they'll become much heavier in, in bonds. Uh, I'm not a fan of that because long term, you have to offset inflation, even though there's little or no inflation today. It is a factor and you need the growth of stocks to maintain a portfolio long term. But more fundamentally, I look at that and I say, you know, I've won the game. Uh, and that means I'm in an even more powerful position to play it. Right. Because I can never, never before have I been in a better position to absorb the volatility than I am not right now because I am financially independent. So, I should probably be a hundred percent in stocks. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do that after this conversation. <laughs> okay. You let us know. Yeah. If you change. <laughs> um, and so that's interesting that there's obviously a, a strong difference between the accumulation phase in your book and the protection phase. Was it the yeah, preservation phase. preservation phase? How do you suggest people transition between the two? Is it something that you do just in one go the day you quit? Do you sort of, do something before or do something after? What's like, how does that look like? Yeah, again, that depends on your tolerance for volatility. What I did is, uh, you know, on the, the, the day that I last left my last corporate job, uh, I just changed it on that day. Uh, now, of course, the risk of that is, you know, maybe that day is one of the days when the market's down 40%. Mm -hmm. and you would have wished that you'd added those bonds sooner. Um, so if you're concerned about that, maybe you could begin making the tradition five, the transition five years out and do it a little bit at a time, but that really depends on how you feel about volatility and, and, and risk and what have you. Uh, I was just comfortable doing it all once. So there's no hard and fast answer. It depends on your own temperament. So this, this transition becomes important for someone who's sort of reaching a file on sort of a tight number right so yeah that, i think that's true the you know if you're if you're reaching fi if you if you're in a job that you really don't like you can't wait to get out and the moment that you're technically fi which is typically defined as four percent so if if you have enough money that that your investments four uh, percent of them cover your annual expenses then that's the definition of being FI. So for instance, if you have a million euros and you're living on 40,000 a year, that's 4% of a million you're there. 
or if you're living on 40,000 and you multiply it by 25, that's another way to get to the number if you want to look at your annual spending. And of course, 40,000 times 25 is a million. So that's kind of the, the baseline of being FI. And yeah, if you, if you want to pull the trigger as soon as you possibly can and you don't have much margin of error, then you probably want to be more conservative in how you make that transition, which is to say, begin it earlier. Yeah. So there's, there's obviously this concept of a sequence of a return risk. Right. The fact that, yes, over the long term, we know that we have, you know, a 7 to 10% average annual return on the stock market in the US, but that could go up and down year after year in any direction, really. Uh, and, and, and it does. Uh, yeah, and it does. And the, the risk is if, if that happens just before you quit or just after you quit, it's that's when it has the biggest impact for you. And so, yeah, this, this smoothing the ride into uh, the preservation phase seems to be the right move for people who are really tight. Um, okay, yeah, it makes makes complete sense. And yeah, it makes complete sense. <laughs> <laughs> I think the only thing I would add to that is if you go back to the Trinity study, which looked very closely at, at, at withdrawal rates, and that's, that's commonly where the 4% rule comes out of. There was a financial advisor in the U.S. who coined the term a little bit before that. But the Trinity study looked at 30-year periods of time. They looked at many, many different allocations everywhere everything from 100% stocks to 100% bonds and everything in between. And then they looked at different percentage draw withdrawal rates. And then they looked at those rates adjusted for inflation or not adjusted for inflation. And they came up with this wonderful set of data. And probably some reporter looked in that data and they noticed that if you had at least 50% in stocks, and you pulled out 4% adjusted for inflation every year, 96% of the time that money lasted for 30 years, right? So there was a 4% failure rate and they thought, wow, that's really good. And therefore we came up with the 4% rule. That takes into account sequence of return risks. So 4% in my mind, at least, is a very conservative number, right? It's some people think, oh, that's way too high. I think it's very conservative. When you look at those charts, you see that the vast majority of time, it was more than enough money. A lot of that time it was not only enough, but at the end of 30 years, you wound up with far more money than you started with, right? So I say to people, 4% is just a guideline. Obviously, if you retire and you start drawing 4% and the market takes a major drop at that point, you're going to want to rethink it. But on the other hand, you're going to want to pay attention because most likely, because it's so conservative, your wealth is going to begin building even though you're not adding to it. And you want to pay attention, certainly, so you don't want, want to run out of money. So if it goes against you, you can make adjustments so you're not broke at the end of 30 years. But you're also going to want to make adjustments in the far more likely scenario where your wealth begins to increase so you can expand your spending and enjoy that money uh, longer. Mm -hmm. The only other caveat I'd put out is the Trinity study did look at 30 years and their definition was there was still money in the account at the end of 30 years. Well, most of the time that money would have been self-perpetuating on to 40, 50, 60 years, but not always. And I'd have to look at the charts again to see but but there were times when it was it lasted for 30 years but by 32 years or 35 years or 40 years it would have dissipated so you want to take that into account and if you're retiring at say 30 and you're looking at a 70 year retirement you might want to be more conservative than four percent in your projections but again you know, if you're retiring at 30, the odds are that you're going to do something that's going to earn you money along the next 70 years. So maybe 4% is, again, conservative. You know, it's hard for me to imagine anybody who's smart and industrious enough to retire at 30 never doing anything productive again for the rest of their lives. But Yeah, it's very difficult 
to imagine like that that as well on my side <laughs> um because we have all this time ahead there's so many ideas that we want to try and different things we want to test so yeah it gives us i mean yes there's so many things we can do and some of that will yeah. will, will bring value because it's valuable to others so it's, yeah it's, uh, hmm. Well, thank you for that. I mean, it's it's really important to talk about those details because often people who come across this rule, they think it's it's a four percent rule and it's like a hard rule and you can just follow it and it'll be fine. But as you as you just described, it depends a lot on very personal, um, well, your personal situation, your age, yeah, your exactly. capacity think, to adapt, and all of that, right? I think a lot. You know, there's an awful lot of discussion over the four percent rule, and it really lot of debate about it and it really comes down to that unfortunate choice of word rule yeah and it was probably some reporter who looked at the study and coined the term and it's a you know it's a it's a great headline it's a great catchy term i can see why a reporter would want to use it but then you know people get get hung up on it it becomes like you know a, a couple hundred years ago theologians we're arguing about how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. These were serious arguments, right? They might seem ludicrous to us today, but they were seriously arguing about how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. And, you know, the arguments over the 4% rule strike me in the same fashion. It's, it's kind of silly. All you need to do is realize that it's not a rule. It's a guy, it's a terrible rule. It's a wonderful guideline. And once you change the word to guideline, then you don't have to worry about how many angels are dancing on the head of a pin. <laughs> yes, it's just a choice of word, right? Um, thanks for that. Um, so, JL, there is a lot of talk right now around the situation being this time is different. You no, know? COVID, the fact that the stock market rebounded so fast, how it seems to be so disconnected from the real economy. What do you think of all that, this disconnect? To the real economy and then does that impact how we should perceive the four percent guideline going forward in the years that come ahead well i'll, I'll answer the second part first because that's easier no i don't i don't think what's happening with COVID uh, has any bearing on how i invest or how i see the four percent guideline or or anything else COVID as terrible as it's been will, you know, it will pass. Uh, at some point we'll have treatments and vaccinations. Uh, but even if we didn't have that medical technology that we have pandemics uh, in, we've, this is not the first pandemic in history and pandemics pass. They don't last forever. It's just the nature of the beast. And now we do have this medical technology. So COVID is, is not going to last forever and it's not going to have a long-term effect on on the markets it's not a civilization ending event um as far as the disconnect between the markets and the economy the stock market is not the economy right so a fairly large portion of the economy in europe i'm pretty confident certainly in the u.s are, is made up of companies and individuals that are not publicly traded. They're not stocks that you and I could buy. I have a small business. I mean, my blog and my book are, you know, at least the IRS, our internal revenue service considers me a business and they tax me on my revenue. So I have a business. And even there are a lot of large companies in various countries and economies that choose not to go public for whatever reason. So the stock market is just one segment of the economy. What's interesting in this particular case is that it seems that COVID is much more damaging to small businesses, to mom and pop businesses than it is to large businesses. So restaurant chains, which are large, maybe publicly traded companies like McDonald's are probably gonna do fine. Whereas the local bistro down the street from where you live that is run by your neighbors that you, you know, that you love and you patronize, they may not survive this. And so that's probably where the disconnect at this particular moment is coming from. But yeah. So we have the large firms that are probably pulling the rest of the market up, despite that all the small firms are struggling sure. at the bottom and 
Yeah. Um, we, we talked about, uh, I'm coming back to something we talked about earlier, but it's it's an important question for me, but um, we talked about the, the evidence and the academic research that supports index investing and its performance over active, active management. Are, are there specific sources or pieces of research that, that you, that you would refer to that you'd like to, um, to refer to or that you use for yourself for your own understanding of all this? You know, it's it's not something that I that I look at any longer because to me the the case is closed. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I don't. Uh, you know, I it, this is something that I I spent a lot more of my time in the '80s and '90s on, and I I just haven't engaged with it that much. Uh, when I was writing the blog, I think in the book and in the blog, I reference a couple of studies that I that I looked up for that purpose. I I I don't. I can't pull them to mind at the moment, but there wouldn't be hard to find them if you wanted to Google. Yeah. You know, Google is your friend, and there are probably newer ones out since when I came up with the ones for the book five years ago. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks. I'll check the book. I ha I have it, but I haven't. Yeah. I don't think I've come across that specific. You probably check Google and come up with yeah. even more recent things, but the but the. Uh, uh, yeah, the research just continues to confirm the the outperformance of indexing. An interesting question that I get, by the way, is what happens if yeah. everybody begins indexing or a large majority? Because indexing has grown by leaps and bounds. I mean, uh, when Jack Bogle first created index fund investing in Vanguard in the mid-70s, it was mocked in, in, and reviled. I mean... And of course, Wall Street recognized that it was a threat to their fees because they were charging just enormous fees for these actively managed funds. So they recognized the threat. So they did everything they could to strangle it in their crib. Um, the guy who ran Fidelity, uh, Ned Johnson by name, ran a series of ads uh, attacking Vanguard and Jack Bogle for being un-American for having created these things. And Bogle, uh, who was one of my personal heroes, uh, took the ads and framed them and, and put them in his office. Uh, so anyway, you know, indexing was slow to gain traction and there were a lot of powerful forces that tried to, to crush it. But good ideas have a way of just continuing and indexing is one of those. Mm -hmm. Now, at some point, if indexing really becomes dominant, I would guess it's going to make active investing more effective. You know, maybe there will be a period of time where you really are able to outperform the market if, if you're dealing with a smaller segment of it. And if that happens because there's so much money to be made uh, in active investing, if you are the you know, by Wall Street, not by the investor, but by Wall Street, they will, of course, be touting this great success. And then people, humans are humans. They're always looking for something better. And then they'll stampede over to this new thing for a while. And then, of course, it won't work anymore. But balance will be restored. So I don't, that's why I don't worry about indexing taking over the world. Yeah, and it seems that when that comes, if we come to that point where there's a balance, index investing will be sort of the sure way to get the average, whereas all the other ways would be, well, I'm I'm hoping I will get a 50% chance of doing better and a 50% chance, chance of doing worse because in the end, the market is the average. <laughs> no, there's something like that. That's, that's sort of how I look at it from that perspective. Well, except the market isn't the average in that sense because, you know, the, the index outperforms about 80% of the yeah. active managers. So it's not at that 50% level, but that's because the active managers have all these costs and, you know, it's inherently an almost impossible task, but yeah, that's, that, that's, that's not something I spend any time worrying about. No, <laughs> but do you have any sense of the a timeline? Are we talking one year, 10 years, a hundred years, what, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, not only do I not have any sense of the timeline, I don't even know where on the timeline we are at the moment. That's, that's how little I care about this. <laughs> Plus we are all about forecasting the future, right? In the stock market. So yeah, right.
Hi, if you're enjoying this interview, make sure you click the like button and subscribe to the channel. So you're, you're known as the godfather of FI. Where does that come from? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, 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 first of all, when, when it first started being applied to me, I kind of cringed a little bit. <laughs> now I, I candidly, I've grown to, to, to kind of like it. I kind of enjoy it. Uh, my memory is that Christy Shen, who is, is uh, one of the two people who write Millennial Revolution, uh, Christy and, and her husband Bryce write Millennial Revolution, and they are, Christy's also a speaker at our Chautauquas. She is the first one I remember calling me the godfather, and she's certainly been the one who's most actively promoted that. Uh, but I had another friend who reached out to me uh, on email recently and made the comment, taking credit for having coined it. And I don't know that he's wrong, uh, but Christy is the one that, that I first remember saying it. I remember first cringing over hearing her say it. <laughs> so, Yeah, I love their blog and their writing. And the I, fact that I, they called you that, it's, I think it's, it's amazing. I, we, they we also you. have an awesome book out that I wrote the foreword for called Quit Like a Millionaire. Yeah. So, well, we call you the Godfather of in Belgium too. So that's that's a given. You come to Belgium, you're the Godfather. Well, I consider it a great honor. I, <laughs> I, I used to cringe at it. Now I now I revel in it. <laughs> Hopefully, after all this COVID is passed, we'll we'll meet again in Bruges. Well, you know, last year we were doing this in person in yeah. Bruges, right? And yeah. uh, I mean, our, our our intention was to be back in Europe uh, this year, and of course, COVID block that but yeah at some point we'll be back we like cool. hanging out in europe yeah we'll, we'll we're waiting for you um <laughs> where where do you see the fi movement going in the future it seems like it's it's taking off but where is it going you know that's an interesting question and i i think my opinion is a little different i think a lot of people in the fi community think that it's going to continue to grow and sort of take over the world. We kind of like a lot of people think indexing is going to take over the world. I don't think so. I think we're, it's certainly growing. There's no question about that. It's, there's, it's grown dramatically since I started my blog in 2011, but I think we're destined to remain unicorns. Uh, the, you know, the world is filled with companies aggressively marketing their products. This is not some terrible conspiracy, but McDonald's wants to sell as many hamburgers as they can. So they're going to be advertising, you deserve a break today. Uh, Mercedes wants to sell as many luxury cars as they can. So they're going to be advertising that if you buy a fancy luxury car, you know, the opposite sex is going to find you more attractive and your neighbors will be impressed and you'll be a better human. And, and there's billions, trillions of dollars spent on that kind of marketing. And against that, voices in the FI community, which seem large to those of us in the FI community, are literally a drop in the ocean. And so, I, yeah, I think this is always going to be be a small part of, of how people live their lives. Uh, I think it's a better way to live your life. And, and, you know, I hope more people embrace it, but I think the lore of, of you deserve a break today and you deserve to be driving a fancy car and living in the biggest possible house. Or that's, mm. that's, I think, very powerful lore for most people. Yeah, it is. And it sort of sets us apart that we are able to think a bit differently about those things. Yeah, and it depends too on on what you value. I mean, I, you know, I I've never thought of living on half of my income as deprivation. A lot of people hear me say that, and they, especially people not in the FI community, they say, well, "That's that's terrible. It's deprivation. You know, you should be had a better life if you spent that money." My reply to that is I am spending that money. I'm just buying the most important thing to me, which is my freedom. Mm -hmm. Now, freedom might not be the most important thing to you, and it's not up to me to decide. I mean, a big house and the Mercedes might be more important to you, and no judgment there. I mean, that's your choice. But for me, 
I can't imagine anything I would rather spend my money on than my personal freedom. And of course, you buy your freedom by having investments that throw off money so you don't have to trade your time for and labor for income. But that's just me. I don't expect anybody else to have that same value. I think this goes back to my, I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. You know, that's just. If we had the cameras on, you'll see all the, the entire audience going like this. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> well, good. At least I'm, I'm talking to a friendly audience. <laughs> I mean, some audiences, they'd be, they'd be grabbing their tomatoes and winding their arm up. <laughs> uh, I, I, um, I am personally very interested in what the faculty could do in the future. Um, I, I think we could have an impact. Do, do you see something beyond financial education that we could do? Um, like, is there an impact? Like, instead of converting everyone to FI, isn't our culture or our power of having enough, isn't that going to make a change maybe at some level? Well, I, I think it, it probably will, and probably in, in multiple ways. I think when you're free, I, I think, first of all, it's, it's an inherent good for people to be free. I think the more people who are free, the better things are. And, of course, the more free people there are, the, the more their creativity is unleashed. You know, when you're working every day and you're living paycheck to paycheck and the struggling to pay the bills, you don't have necessarily a lot of room to have an impact on the world around you. But when you're free of that, you do. And whether that impact is that you're creating art or you're volunteering in some way, or you're building a business that is going to employ other people, uh, you know, there's a myriad of ways that the world becomes a better place. And I think the world fundamentally is made better by people who have that freedom and they don't necessarily have that necessarily have to be financially independent for it. I mean, some people just do it without the safety net of financial independence. And I applaud that too. It's a lot riskier because if things go against you, then, you know, you can wind up in a bad situation, but uh, you know, great things in the world are accomplished by bold people. And if you have FU money or you're financially independent, it is easier to be a bold person. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And uh, in the community, we see more and more people who are either reaching FI and have a mission that is beyond themselves, like really they have some sort of calling for a big cause. But there's also people who are really into FI as a way to be able to do more, right? Right. Because they feel constrained by the need of making money, and they're looking at this as a way to to yeah, unleash some sort of you know like this energy that's inside them. <laughs> it's yeah, kind of exactly. stuck. The the creativity. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, yeah, that's why I say you know again going back to the four percent rule, and people say, well, maybe that's too aggressive, and if you retire at thirty, and you know. It's, when you draw down for 70 years, is 4% really, well, yeah, maybe not. Maybe you need to be cautious if you're not going to do anything but sit in a rocking chair for the next 70 years. But again, people in the FI community, at least in my experience, aren't people who sit in rocking chairs. You know, they're people who are just incredibly engaged and creative and are out doing things. And it's almost inevitable that some of that activity is going to throw off money even if that's not the goal. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, I, at Chautauqua, I do one-on-one -on -one sessions with people and, and sometimes I'll get somebody who will say something like, uh, you know, I, I'm, I hate my job. I'm in this soul killing job. I can't wait to get out of it. And, you know, I'm looking at my numbers and I need $50,000 a year to live on. And I have a million dollars invested. So, you know, I'm not at that 4% rule, but I'm at the soul killing job, you know, and I just, I don't know what to do. And my answer to that, especially if they're young, my answer to that is I quit my job yesterday. I mean, you're, you know, when you look at that Trinity study, 
you know, if you need 50,000 a year, you got a million, that's a 5% withdrawal rate. Well, guess what? A 5% withdrawal rate succeeds something like 80 for 85% of the time. Those are incredibly good odds. I mean, incredibly good odds. And that's assuming you do nothing to earn money. I wouldn't stay in a soul killing job for a moment longer than I had to if my withdrawal rate was 5%. 85% of the time, I'm going to do be fine if I do nothing. And you know what? If I hit that sequence of return risk you were talking about, the market turns down and turns against me, then I'll go out and I'll get a part-time job. How hard is it going to be to find a job that'll pick up another $10,000 a year that'll make up that, that amount that's missing, you know, from, from my, you know, be bold. I think people, you know, I, when I hear the discussions around this stuff and it's based so much on fear, you know, what if, what if I don't have enough? What if the 4% rule is too aggressive? What if, you know, I mean, yeah, that's a possibility and maybe you'd have to figure that out. But my advice would be bold, be bold. And on the other hand, if you come to me and you say, you know, I, I, I need 50 grand to live on, I got a million dollars and I love what I'm doing, I'm gonna say, keep doing it. You know, if you love what you're doing and you've got $10 million and you're living on 50,000 a year, keep doing it. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, doesn't just because you're financially independent doesn't mean you have to quit your job, right? So. Yeah, and this, this, uh, this aspect of fear, I find that in a way, financial independence is sort of hiding the power of a few money, which you described so well at the beginning yeah. of the interview, where with a few money, that person can already make bold moves. And that would have been, that could have been 200,000 euros instead of a million, right? Yeah. Um, but we tend to, because we're so focused on this ultimate number and we're so afraid of market crashes, it's true that sometimes we forget that we can do so much with so much less sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and, and the... You know, you're not even if you if you retire at 35 and you say and you say, you know what, I don't ever want to work again. I'm burned out. You know, I'm, I've just had it. And that's your mindset. It doesn't mean you're going to feel that way at 40. Mm-hmm. You know, I think things change. I mean, whether financially you're forced to reconsider or not. So it's just again, when I was a few years out of college and had that five thousand dollars burning a hole in my pocket and and I wanted to go to Europe. I mean, that I suppose that was a risk. I suppose that had I done that, it could have been a tough two years getting another professional job. But, you know, make the bold choice. I mean, we live in an incredible moment in history. And for all of the people living, listening to this who are in Western Europe or in Europe, in the US, we live in an incredible moment in history in an incredible places on the planet. I mean, why not be bold? Why not take advantage of that? Yeah, in the end, money is a tool for us to use and make our lives better, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And- money, I've I've said, you know, money is we live in a very complex society, and money is the single most powerful tool that we humans have created to navigate that society. And so you will clearly be better off if you learn how to use that tool. Christy uh, Shen, who we talked about earlier, and I'm gonna butcher this quote, but I love it. She says something of the effect of, if you know how to use money, life is incredibly easy. If you don't, life is incredibly hard. And you only need to look around at your own circle of acquaintances to see that in action. People have figured out how to use the tool of money, have a much smoother path in life than people who don't and who are living paycheck to paycheck. That is very, very, very powerful <laughs> and so true. <laughs> um, so, Jill, a bit more of a, a personal question. We've talked a lot about investing and freedom and a bit about financial education. What, what other topics are you passionate about what are other like what what other interests do you have and what are what are your passions and things that you do in life in general oh I, you know I, I i actually to a certain extent i'm not all that interested in this financial stuff anymore because i've done so much of it for so many decades mm-hmm. i enjoy this i enjoy 
sharing what I know, but I don't spend a whole lot of time reading about it. You were asking me about the research around uh, yeah. you know, active versus, I don't spend a lot of time looking at that stuff anymore. I, I try to read some of the blogs that are out in the FI community because a lot of them are my friends among other things, but even that isn't that interesting. I have a, a layman's interest in uh, some various scientific uh, disciplines. I, and, I, and I emphasize a layman's interest. I don't have any expertise, but I'm always fascinated by what they're discovering in astronomy. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by uh, evolution, uh, you know, particularly human evolution, but, and also the kid in me is still excited about dinosaurs and, and I was disappointed that nobody bought Stan for me. Stan, if you all don't know, was the T-Rex skeleton that just went on auction at Christie's in New York and sold for $32 million. I would have thought somebody would have bought it for me, but <laughs> evidently nobody did. So, yeah, those are the, those are the kinds of things that I'm, I'm interested in. I'm, I certainly have no expertise in them, but, uh, you know, uh, I think one of the best nonfiction books I've ever read is Sapiens by, um, I can never, he's an Israeli guy. I can never think of his name. Yuval Noah Harari. Yeah, yeah. We, exactly. We yeah, talked about that, the book. Uh... Yeah. I think that's probably my, my all time favorite nonfiction book. And it's the story of how us humans became the wacky, goofy creatures that we are and why we believe the silly things we believe, basically how we evolved. And I find that pretty fascinating. In fact, you know, that's a book that's gotten a lot of praise. And the one criticism that I saw of it, maybe there are others, but the one criticism I saw of it said something along the lines of all this guy's done is pulled together, you know, research and information done by other people. And anybody who knows anything about evolution isn't going to find anything new in this book. And I thought to myself, well, I know a fair amount about human evolution. And he's right. There was nothing new in this book. And he did kind of bring all this stuff together. But that's the brilliance of the book, is he brought all of this stuff together in, in one incredibly readable book. So, yeah, what this guy thought as a criticism was, I think, one of the strengths. But there you go. Yeah, it's like he's written our, our history of all of yes. us. No? It's like a little bio biography for humanity and it's exactly you have to tell it in a beautiful story for it to be exciting because you don't want to go into these evolution books which are horrible to read <laughs> and, and it also helps you understand why we believe the goofy things we believe like money right <laughs> like, like, <laughs> like money is one of them yeah. why this whole fi thing is even possible it's because we, <laughs> yeah it explains it really well there yeah Yeah. Well, yeah, he, he even talks about how powerful money is. You know, he, I, one of my favorite parts of the book along those lines is, and I'm probably, I mean, you might be able to help me on this, but at one point he's talking about how, how universal money is. And yeah. of course, for better or worse, the United States, the U.S. dollar is the world currency, right? And he talks about, the ISIS terrorists in, in the Middle East who evidently commandeered a bank uh, somewhere in, in Iraq and found hundreds of millions of dollars in U.S. currency and $100 bills. And as Yuval points out, you know, this is, this is printed by the great Satan. You know, the United States is printed by the great Satan. It has in God we trust, you know, the wrong God from the Islamic point of view. You would think, of course, they would burn these demonic things, but no, they didn't burn them. <laughs> Because yeah. money is the more powerful concept. Yeah, it's higher than religion at that level, no? Even well, for I, them, like, so, so convinced by what they're fighting for. Right. I mean, we're there. They are pragmatic enough to realize, that, <laughs> as I said a moment ago, money is the most powerful tool we have to navigate this complex world we've created. Yeah, that's a very powerful story. Yeah. One, and one of the things that, that irritates me a little bit in the FI community is every now and again, 
I'll see somebody making a comment along the lines of money's not important. There are things that are more important than money and blah, blah, blah. Well, certainly there are things that on a human level are more important than money. But there's a guy called the White Coat Investor. That's the name of his blog. He's, he's a doctor. And I wish this is a line I wish I'd come up with. But I, maybe because he's a doctor, he came up with it. He said, you know, money is like oxygen, right? If you have enough oxygen, if you have enough air to breathe, you never think about it. It's not important. But the moment you don't have enough, there is immediately, instantly nothing more important than oxygen. And money is the same thing. So when I hear these people saying, oh, money is really not important, I think, you know, you say that because you have enough. But if you didn't have enough, it would be the only thing you thought about mm -hmm. because it's the tools that get you food and water and everything else we need in the society to live. So I'm a little impatient with people who are dismissive of money. It is, it's, it's the great tool. There's maybe a lack of understanding of how important it is to people who don't have the chance of being, you know, living or being born in these countries, right? Basically, that's it. Exactly. I mean, and you're, you know, it's again, it's, yes, oxygen is completely unimportant as long as I have enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The yeah. moment I don't have it enough, it's there's nothing more important. Thank you, Jill. That was, I mean, that was super interesting. And I mean, you keep you keep sharing such wisdom and like really good stories. Wow. Thank you for that. Um, we, we're getting to the end of what I had in in mind, but there's still okay. a few questions I'd like to ask you, and then we'll uh, we'll go and look at the questions from the audience. So for those of you guys who are listening and we're still here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I think most people are still here. <laughs> Please ask your questions on the Slido website that has been shared in the chat. And please upvote the questions that are already there uh, so that we don't duplicate too many. Um, I'm going to ask uh, a few last questions and then we'll go to those those questions from the audience. Um, Jill, I hope you still have some time. Sure, let's go for it. Well, thank I'm you. Gonna, have fun. <laughs> You're very generous with your time and the whole community here appreciates it really. So what is the one? Yeah. 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 Thanks. So what is the one thing you want people to remember from this conversation? Well, that's tough because we covered a lot of ground. I suppose when it comes to investing, the probably the single most important thing to remember is that market downturns and crashes are normal. They're a normal part of the process. They're, again, scary, they're unpleasant, uh, they can be damaging, but they should never be surprising. They should never cause us to panic. They are normal. We should expect them. Mm -hmm. See, make no mistake, when, you know, when the market is plunging and you look at your holdings and they're down 30, 40, 50%, I mean, it, it has me, ruins my day too, you know, so... Yeah, it's not, I'm not suggesting it's easy, <laughs> which is why it's so important to remember. Well, we'll call you when that happens. <laughs> we listen to what you have to say. Yeah, when when the market was plunging uh, uh, earlier this year in the spring, I suddenly became a really popular guy. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to hear your wisdom <laughs> so that they can steer the course. Okay. Everybody wants to hear it again. Yeah. yeah. Um, if there was one action that, people could take following this conversation, what would it be? Well, I, you know, I, I would say if you're not investing already and you're intrigued by what I've had to say, then I would say the first thing to do is start reading my blog or read my book, understand what my approach is. And by definition, I'll, I explain in those things what the stock market is and how it really acts and then decide if it's the right, path for you and it's a great path to build wealth but again you have to be willing to tolerate that vol volatility and absolutely not panic when it when it happens uh, yeah short of that if for those people who are already on the course congratulations you're on a you're on a great path that will make your life better and better and, and the lives of the people around you better and better yeah so the book is something everybody everyone should listen sorry should should buy and read or we, there's also an audio version 
Yeah, I was going to say they could listen to it too. There is an right. audio version. Yeah. Is that is that you reading it? Yep, that's me reading okay, it. Okay, even more reasons to actually get the audio <laughs> version. <laughs> um, okay, my last question is, what is the best way for people to follow your work? So obviously we know you about your blog, your book. Are there other ways for people to follow what you do? Well, that's you know the. Um, I don't, I don't post on the blog much anymore because as I said earlier, I, I, to a certain extent, I've sort of lost interest in the financial stuff, but uh, there's a lot of material there and it still gets a lot of traffic. And every now and again, I, I do put something up. I put a fair amount up in the spring when the market was collapsing. So that's one way. Of course, the book is one way. And then I'm on Twitter and Facebook. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, if anybody's interested, those are probably the best ways to to pay attention to what I'm up to. Well, you can expect an an extra hundred people following you, I think, in the <laughs> next ten minutes. <laughs> I, I see some comments in the chat. People saying, "I just bought the audio version of the book." <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, yeah. All right. I hope they I hope they enjoy it. If you'd like to join future events of the same kind, participate and ask questions. Uh, then make sure to subscribe to the newsletter and join the Facebook group Financial Independence Belgium because that's where you will find all the information about the future events and how to join them. Um, thanks a lot, Jill. So we're going we're gonna to go and take a look at the questions. Um, there are questions. That's, Sounds good. That's good. I wasn't sure because you know, I, I hadn't checked. Um, all right. So I'm going to start by reading the top rated questions. All right. Very, very specific question. So this is a question by Chris, and he refers to your book. He says, by page 108, I'm going to go get it. 108 of your book. I don't know if you have a copy of your own book. I do. I mean, right. Maybe we should go to page 108. <laughs> <laughs> what did I say on 108? You have to yeah, remember. This I, was, is I was writing this in, uh, you know, over the course of a couple of years. And this is actually a question I... I wanted to ask you, so this is brilliant. I'm really glad Chris okay. asked this question. So, yeah, so of your book, you say studies indicate that having 10, 20% in bonds provide better results than 100% stock, but you still recommend 100% stock. Could you explain? So, you know, there, there have been some studies, uh, and again, this is back when I was looking at this kind of stuff that suggests that having a portion of bonds, uh, 10, 20% will actually outperform 100% stocks over time. And I think the reason for that, as I recall, is it does allow you that rebalancing. So when stocks plunge, you have some dry powder to buy them at a, at a discount. But as I recall those studies, the the margin of outperformance was very slim. It was a very small percentage. And small percentages can easily come and go. And if I were looking just, if I was completely comfortable with volatility, and just looking for maximum uh, performance year in, year out over time, 100% stocks is just easier. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to, you don't have to mess around with it. And I think the potential to get maybe a slightly better response isn't probably isn't worth the effort. And there's no guarantee that you're even going to get it. So there's some things that are worth the effort and some that are not worth the effort. For instance, a great example of that is, I'll get the question here in the US anyway, you know, should I be in the S&P 500 fund or in VTSAX, which is the total stock market fund? And when you look at the charts on those things, they track extremely closely. Now, if you and I were to buy, you were to buy one and I was to buy the other today and 10 years from now we look at it, one of them by definition will outperform. But it'll be very, the outperformance will be very slight and there's no predicting which it will be. I prefer the index 500 or the uh, total stock market fund simply, I like the idea of having all the stocks. Uh, Jack Bogle, the guy who created index funds, held the index 500 fund, which was the first one he created all his life. Um, if it's good enough for Jack Bogle, it's good enough for anybody listening to us. So again, mm-hmm. those are things I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time worrying about. Yeah, yeah. I think there's also an argument which you mentioned in your book that um, having a bit of bonds smoothens the ride a little bit. 
Yeah. So maybe it gives a bit of like it de it definitely does that. I think that's mm -hmm. the reason to have the bonds is more than any outperformance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um some of the questions we've already covered. There's a question here, someone who's asking you if you were a uh, European, uh, maybe a younger European, would you still be 100% invest in the US stock market or would you add some non US stocks? Wow, so that's a great question. And if if I'm remembering correctly, when I was in uh, Bruges last year, yeah, we asked this question. <laughs> we, talked, we talked about this then. And when I was in Amsterdam, I did a couple of reader meetups. And this is a subject that came up. So no, for Europeans, if I were European, I would not be 100% in US stocks. Uh, I would probably be in a world fund. I forget the, the Vanguard World Fund. I, I'm a big fan of Vanguard for a lot of reasons. Low cost is one of them. But they have a fund that invests in the entire world. And the US is about 50% of that fund. And that's about what the US represents in terms of the total world economy. Um, so if I were a European, that's where I would be. I wouldn't be in just uh, Belgium or just England or just Germany or just France, because frankly, those economies are too small to invest in. The US is the only economy that is big enough that I can, you can get away with only investing in the US. But that too is changing. And this is a conversation I have with my daughter, who of course is an American. At some point, she's probably going to want to move to that world fund because since World War II, the dynamic, at the end of World War II, uh, every advanced economy in the world at that time was in ashes from World War II, with one exception, and that was the United States, because other than Pearl Harbor, this is the only country where that war wasn't fought on their soil. So our factories weren't bombed, our cities weren't bombed. So coming out of World War II, the world economy essentially was the United States. And then with the Marshall Plan, Europe began to rebuild, Japan, China all began to rebuild. So coming out of World War II, the United States is probably 95% of the world economy. And then slowly but surely, the percentage that the US represents has gotten smaller over the last 70 years. Not because things are going badly for the US, things are going very well for the US, but because the rest of the world is doing better and better and better. So while our percentage of the pie for the US is now about 50%, where it might have been 95%, it is a much bigger pie. That's good for everybody. That's good for the entire world. It's obviously good for Europe that it's not in ashes anymore, that it's prospering. I see that trend continuing. I see that pie getting bigger and bigger. I see the U.S. percentage of it getting smaller and smaller, even as the U.S. continues to prosper more and more. So at some point, the U.S. won't be dominant enough that I would be comfortable owning just the U.S., just like I wouldn't be comfortable uh, if I were a citizen of any European country owning just that country. Right now, I think the U.S., is the best place for me to be. But at some point, and you know, it might be a decade or two down in the future, for my daughter, who's much younger, she's probably going to want to be in a world economy. And if I were in any other country, I'd just go there now. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yeah, yeah, and a great <clears throat> answer. Thank you very much for that. For those of you who are listening and interested in the Vanguard Total World, whole world stock market ETF, VWCE is one of those that we use the most in Belgium. And there yeah, I thought go. I would just I would just share that for those who are here. And it's, it's like yeah. the most optimal choice from a tax perspective as well for Belgium. Um, but it's details. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have another couple of really interesting questions here. Um, this question is from Omar. And he says, when it comes to delayed gratification, how do you manage to find the balance between money to spend today and money to spend in 20 years? Thanks a lot. Well, you know, again, for me, I, it, it never felt like I was delaying anything. I, I just, and probably because I did it from the beginning, you know, I came out of college. Uh, I lived very lean uh, in college because I, I had to. 
So I came out of college. I got my first professional job making 10,000 a year, as I said, and that was decent money in those days, probably, probably equivalent of 50,000 a day. And I lived on half of that and living on $5,000 was a pretty big step up from what I was living on in college. And so that didn't feel like I was any deprivation at all. And then as they say, as my income continued to rise, you know, when I was making 20,000 a year, then I was living on 10. So it just never felt that way to me. But on the other hand, you know, material things have never been particularly important to me. I, you know, I, I spent my early uh, young adulthood in Chicago, in the city of Chicago, and I lived in one of the less fashionable neighborhoods in Chicago because it was cheap and, but it, it had things that were appealing about it too. And that some of my friends who were living in the more fashionable areas would tease me about it. You know, why don't you live down here? And well, you know, I'll live down there because I'd have to pay two or three times more in rent. And I just don't see the value. So again, it, to me, I was buying something much more important. You know, I was buying those investments that represented my freedom, that you know, represented the ability to go to Europe if I wanted to quit my job and go to Europe. And by the way, I, that's something I did throughout my career. I enjoyed my career. I never particularly thought about retiring early. It wasn't a concept I was aware of, but I frequently stepped away from it and took sabbaticals, uh, which is what the FU money allowed me to do. So, you know, that was, I, I was buying exactly what I wanted to buy. So yeah, it was never, it was never hard. Yeah. It's about really knowing what you value and then finding yeah. a balance between yeah. what you need and what you value. And yeah, so beautifully described there. Thanks. Um, another question here, this is from Rahim. Um, he's saying, he's asking when there is a crash, is it a good idea to double down? Double down, meaning invest more money? Mm -hmm. Yes. So certainly when, when the market is down and that's the reason you hold bonds, that's if you're, you know, if you're saving say 50% of your income, certainly you're going to want to continue investing that income. Uh, my only hesitation with that idea of doubling down is there's an implication that you've been sitting on money and leaving it uninvested. And that's where the money to double down is going to come from, right? So in my world, I want my money working as hard as it possibly can all the time. So I never keep money in a savings account waiting for the market to drop so I can double down. Uh, but by the same token, you know, I never stopped investing when the market went down. In fact, I would, I would celebrate it. Um, and I remember watching my daughter as a, account, you know, she invests every month uh, and she doesn't pay too close attention to the stock market because it doesn't interest her, but, you know, she follows the simple path and invests every month. And I noticed in, I forget the percentages, but in March she put in her set amount of money and it bought however many shares it bought. And then in April, because the market had plunged, it, it, same amount of money bought significantly more shares. So if that's what he means by doubling down, absolutely. If on the other hand, he means, should I be setting money aside in a savings account waiting for the market to drop so I can then invest it, then no, I'm not in favor of that because who knows when that's gonna happen. I mean, the market might march up 30% from here and then drop 20% and you'll be investing at 10% higher than you could today. You just can't predict what the market's going to do. So I never make investing decisions trying to guess what the market's going to do. I hope that makes sense. You know, I hope that's that's a clear answer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question here. This is um, an interesting one, but it's obviously something we haven't maybe clarified. Um, it's more of a beginner concept, I would think. But how do you become financially independent if your money is locked away in ETFs, do you start taking out money at some point? Well, so if your money is in ETFs, I mean, that's the investment that you're in, right? So an ETF is an exchange traded fund. 
you named the world fund a moment ago as an ETF, right? So that's just, I mean, it's your money. It's not locked away. You can take it out whenever you want. Um, so yeah, when, when you have enough that you want to retire or you, like I did periodically, you're taking a sabbatical and you're maybe drawing somebody down on it, you just draw down on it. I think the first thing I would do, um, you know, these funds that we've been talking about throw off a dividend. Typically, uh, I think you should have those dividends automatically reinvested as you're building your wealth, because why take them out only to put money back in again? But if you're going to live on it for a while, if you're taking a sabbatical, the first thing I do is start having that dividend paid into my checking account. And then I would sell off a little bit of the share. So VTSAX, as an example, pays about 2% in a dividend. So if you're pulling 4% to live on, you know, you take the 2% dividend and then maybe pull 2% of the shares, sell 2%, you know, as you need it. And that's how you tap into it. And then when I went back to work, I stopped obviously selling the shares and I start reinvesting the dividends again. So I think that's a mechanical question on how to, how to do the withdrawals. And, and if I'm right about that, that's how I would do it. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. Um, a question from Bart here, which is related to bonds. Um, so given the historically low returns of bonds, do you still see a role for them as part of a portfolio? So the short answer is yes. Uh, because I don't hold bonds for the income. Uh, the income's nice. You know, the fact that bonds pay interest is nice, but that's, I hold bonds as a ballast in the portfolio to, to smooth the ride on the stocks as we talked about. But I think there's a more interesting aspect to the question here, and that is, if you go back to the 1980s, uh, you could have bought bonds pretty easily that were paying 10%. And so the total bond market index fund, which is the fund that I recommend for bonds, is paying now about 2.5%. And I don't think it existed in the mid 80s. I think it's a newer fund than that. But if it did in the mid 80s, it probably would be paying interest of about 10%. So if I put the question to you and said, which is better, you know, the fund paying the 10% or the fund paying to 10% back in the eighties, is that better? Or is the fund today paying two and a half percent? So I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think most people <laughs> say, well, of course the 10% is better. And I would suggest that you don't have enough information to answer that question, because unless you know what the inflation rate is, you have no idea what's better. And the reason the bonds were paying 10% in the 80s is that the inflation rate was very high. I want to say it was like 12%. So 10% on your bonds was a net loser. Every year you were losing 2%. Today, inflation's maybe half a percent and my bond funds paying two and a half percent. I would rather have my two and a half percent today than the 10% of the 1980s. I'm ahead of the game, very counterintuitive, but that's the correct way to think of it. The interest rates you earn are meaningless without knowing the underlying inflation and interest rates are very closely tied to inflation. So the only way you have very high interest rates is when you have equivalently high inflation. So what you need to ask is not what's my interest rate, what's the difference between my interest rate and the inflation rate. And right now, it's not bad. Yeah, it's thank you. It's not great, but it's not bad. Yeah, that's a great response. I, I, haven't, I wasn't looking at it like that, so thanks for that. Um, we have a few more questions with three thumbs up, and I think we're going to just do those. Okay. And then we we'll stop because it's also getting a bit late for everyone. But uh, so oh, wow, we've been going for almost two hours. Yeah, it's been two hours <laughs> since we started. Is anybody still listening? Or <laughs> well, let me check. Let me check. How many people do we have here? At least fifty people are still here. I think we were at sixty-five. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> and they seem to be very motivated in the chat. So. All right. Uh, well, 
let's <laughs> It, it's it's only mid afternoon for me, so I'm fine to go. <laughs> maybe we'll take a break and we come back for like round two, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we'll do more on another day. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's do those last three questions here. So we have a question okay. from from Ton, who's asking, um, "What do you think of many governments in developing countries stimulating home ownership? Is it a mistake? Is it unfair to people preferring to rent and own stocks? What's your perspective on that?" So stimulating home ownership. ownership, yeah, yeah. It, so, well, that's a that's a that's a complex question. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in the United States, going back to to the crash of 0708, right? That was a fundamentally in the United States a real estate crash, and there were a lot of things that went into it. But one of the key factors was that the government decided that the opportunity to build wealth should be available to more people than it was currently available to. And there was an assumption that owning your own home was a way to build wealth. And so they wanted to make home ownership available to lower income people. Now all of that sounds like a wonderful thing to do, right? So you enable lower income people to buy homes and then they can get on the track as those homes appreciate of becoming wealthier and that's good for them, it's good for the country, it's good, good, good. The problem is that bankers weren't denying mortgages, home loans to those lower income people just to be mean. They were denying those loans because they were concerned that those people wouldn't be able to pay them back. And in fact, that's what happened is you had a lot of loans that were made to people that were guaranteed uh, by the government that, that were made to people who simply didn't have the financial wherewithal. And in some cases, frankly, the, the discipline of paying a mortgage. And so suddenly you had a lot of hoses sold, a lot of mortgages out, and traditionally, mortgages were considered very, very secure investments because they were secured against a house and nobody was going to lose their house. They were going to do everything they could to keep their house. But suddenly you had a whole different kind of lender in place and who weren't able to maintain those mortgages. And you had a cascade of defaults. And that was one of the key things that precipitated this problem. So stimulating home ownership is a noble cause and it's fraught with unintended consequences. So for that reason, I'm not a fan. Uh, I'm also not a fan of the idea that owning a home by definition is going to make you wealthier. Homes are very expensive. They're expensive to buy, they're expensive to maintain, there are taxes involved with them, there are transaction costs inevitably you're going to be seduced into spending more money on them. You're not going to spend 20,000 euros to remodel your kitchen on your rental apartment, but you pretty commonly will on your, on your house. So houses, I, I think there's been a lot of propaganda around homeownership as a wealth building tool. To me, it's a lifestyle. And if you can afford it and it provides the lifestyle that you want and you can easily afford it, then by all means, own a home. Owning it, thinking it's an investment, I think is, is, a, is a dangerous thing to think. And I think that's mostly propaganda from the industry. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. We have another question that is also related to the government. Um, this question is from Ton. He's asking, are you worried about the extreme monetary policy interventions that seem to be the norm in the US and around the world nowadays? Wow, that's a great, great question. And um, I'm going to focus on the US because that's what I know best. And the short answer is yes, I'm worried about it. It's, it's the one thing, it's my biggest worry about the US and the US economy. I think it's in many ways, the, the biggest uh, challenge that 
we face in the United States. And I think it's made all the bigger by the fact that not a single political party in this country or a single politician is even talking about it or is even recognizing the problem. Uh, you know, with COVID, I mean, the, after the last collapse in 07, 08, we spent trillions of dollars uh, pulling the U.S. economy out of that hole. And of course, in the because the U.S. is so dominant in the world economy, that helped enormously in pulling the rest of the world out of it too. That was a necessary thing to do, a good thing to do. But it ballooned our debt. Um, and then coming out of World War II, as an example, we had very high debt. But then in the good times, that debt got paid down. Well, in the good times that followed the 08, 07, 08 collapse, instead of paying that debt down, we spent more. And the United States is spending a trillion dollars a year more than we take in in taxes. That's incredible. And at the beginning of COVID, our national debt stood at, I want to say, $22 trillion. That's just about 100% of our GDP. Now, that's doable. I don't think that's great monetary policy to have debt that equals 100% of your GDP. But, you know, modern economists tell us that, that that's perf per perfectly doable. Now with COVID, we're spending trillions upon trillions more. I think we're up to 28 trillion in national debt. We're up to something like 138% of GDP. That's an incredible, an incredible increase in an incredibly short period of time. Even then, I wouldn't be concerned if there was more political recognition of how serious that is and more of a plan to unwind it when we can. There's a good argument to be made that we have to spend this money with, given what COVID has done to the economy. Um, and I would go along with that. But, and I would go along with the idea that yes, we can absorb 138%, especially in this age of incredibly low interest rates. But at some point, it will be too much. And I would feel much more comfortable with it if there was, if I was hearing concern mm -hmm. about it and plans to deal with it once this crisis passes. And I'm not hearing that. So yes, it's a definite concern. Does this change your perspective on anything we've spoke about earlier? The approach strategy, what we can do about it? Do we do anything about it? So I don't think there's really anything you can do about it. You know, you have to, you know, you, you have to plan the way you invest based on the most likely scenarios, right? If you always invest expecting Armageddon, then you're going to be investing in things that are not going to benefit you if Armageddon doesn't come and you're probably going to get a worse result because the odds are that Armageddon is not going to come, that we will muddle through. So personally, I choose to structure my investments and my plans based on what is 99% likely to happen rather than the 1% that is unlikely to happen. But that doesn't mean that I don't worry about things. And this is the big one I worry about economically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, And again, you know, I don't worry about even at 138%, which I find personally horrifying, even that doesn't worry me in and of itself. It's the fact that we don't seem to be, our political leaders don't seem to even be aware of it, let alone planning to deal with it. So we stay the course and we'll see. I, well, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stay the course and, and, and we'll see. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. I think we had one more. Yes, here we go. This is the last question. And then we'll do a group picture all together. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like we did last time in Bruges. So here's a question from Edwin. Um, he says, uh, how difficult is it to choose the proper withdrawal strategy? My head starts spinning around thinking about safe withdrawal rate versus 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 
uh, variable, I think withdrawal rates, asset allocation, bond tent, cash cushions, et cetera, et cetera. Like, what's the simple path to withdrawal rates? <laughs> so, well, there, there, there's two, there, there's sort of two uh, aspects to that question. One is the mechanical aspect. And, you know, how do you mechanically withdraw money? And then the other one is, is I think more the strategic, you know, percentage kinds of things. And I, th I think he's asking about the second one more than the first. So let me just address the first real quickly. I have a post in this talk series about how to withdraw things mechanically. And so first of all, what I did is because again, I was an active investor for a long time. I think this applies to a lot of people. You wind up owning a lot of things other than your core index funds. So those were the things I sold off first, right? To raise the money that I, that I needed to meet living expenses once I stopped working. And then once you get past that, as we talked about earlier, you know, I, I had the, the, any dividends that, that were of, available instead of having them reinvested. I had them paid directly into my checking account and then periodically I just sell shares based on what I needed. I never, and I think this kid is getting more into the core of the question that he's asking. Uh, I never thought of 4% as being the rule. So when I first gave up my corporate job for the last time, which happened to be in 2011, it was when my daughter was in college and college in the United States is very expensive. So our expenses were up. And I think in those days, my withdrawal rate was probably five, maybe even 6%. Now I kept a really close eye on the market. And of course, in those days, the market was recovering from the collapse and I had the wind at my back. And so that worked out just fine. And then when she comes out of college, our expenses drop and, you know, now, and at the same time, the, the blog began to generate some income around 2016, and that's when the book came out. So now I don't draw on the portfolio at all. So, you know, things vary. That's why it's the 4% guideline rather than the 4% rule. So, yeah, I think that's, you, you sort of have to be willing to shift with what's going on in the market and what's going on in your life and what's going on with your personal needs and keeping an eye on the ball and, and both to make sure you don't run out of money as we talked about earlier, but also because the odds are that you're going to wind up with much, much more money than you ever expected if you do only 4% over decades. So you probably want to enjoy that money rather than just letting it accumulate. A uh, short follow-up question, and then we'll take the picture. W what about cash? How much cash do you hold? Do you have like, a, is it just a usual three to six months emergency fund? Or do you have more um, for comfort or? Yeah, so I don't, uh, you know, these days I, I, I don't hold a given percentage of cash. You know, I, again, I have an income coming in because of this yeah. little business that, that my blog and my book have turned out to be. Um, but I don't really think about that. I never really had an emergency fund. I always kept enough cash on hand to pay my bills. And, uh, you know, it, again, it sort of depends on the life you're living. If, you know, if you have an old house that is prone to need repairs and you worry about the furnace going out, then you're probably going to want to have a different emergency fund than somebody who, who rents an apartment. If you have an old car that might need repairs, you know, you might have a different need emergency fund than someone who doesn't own a car at all. Uh, so I think there are a lot of personal things that go in, but I think emergency funds can be overdone. Uh, and again, I, my goal was always to keep my money working as hard as it possibly could and sitting in an emergency fund, that's not working all that hard. Well, Gerald Collins, thank you so much for your generous, your generosity in terms of time and all the wisdom. I mean, learning from someone who's been investing for such a long time is 
uh, a blessing for young people like me and I'm sure for everyone in the audience because we get to cheat a little bit instead of having to learn the mistakes one by one we we get them all downloaded in our heads and hopefully it helps us uh, stay the course <laughs> yeah well I, I hope that's the case because I you know the somebody once asked me how do you know all this stuff <laughs> My answer is because I've made, if there's a stupid mistake you can make, I've made it. And that's the really expensive way to learn it. So I'm, I hope that having this conversation, I, I help the people listening avoid at least a couple of the stupid mistakes that I've made. I'm certain. I'm certain. Yeah. I mean, this is so valuable for the community. Thank you so much. So I suggest we, everyone turns on their camera. And we're going to take a group picture. <laughs> Turn on your camera, your microphone, if you want to say thank you personally to Jail Collins. This is the time. Uh, well, let me first say thank you to everybody for showing up and, and, and listening. This has been a lot of fun for me. A word for Jail? Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks thank a lot. Thank you so much. Really, really loved it. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks all for coming. Let's take a picture. So if you don't mind uh, just saying hello and smiling, I'm going to take a snap of, uh, of, the, of the screen. Okay. Give me a second. Give me a second. Uh, yeah, it's pizza day for you guys. Yeah, I know. All right, say hi. Cheers. Hi. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> I'm, having, I'm having different individuals. I have a bunch of people.